The history of food of indigenous America is one of the more fascinating aspects of native culture, with the land's vast array of tribes and lifestyles bringing together diverse foods to allow for some of the most unique cuisine you can think of. It gives sense to the idea that America hasn't always been home to any and every meal you could think of. In fact, go back more than a few decades and you probably wouldn't be able to recognize the food scene as it stands today. Needless to say, the culture of food, no matter what country or continent you hail from, has changed over the years, whether it's from the way we eat, prepare, store, or source each of our meals. While the mass production of both farming and artificial processed foods has changed the way we eat, fast food, chain restaurants, and convenient dining hasn't always been possible especially prior to the 20th century. Despite the differences in appearance, however, it doesn't remove the beauty and context hiding within every dish available to us throughout indigenous history. Most of our images depicting the native cuisine on America's frontier might consist of a simple bundle of picked berries or a slab of dried bison meat, but we can promise you it was so much more than rations and preserves. To learn more about the wonderful food seen across communities in pre-colonial America, here is the first video in a series of essays detailing the diet of the indigenous tribes. First up, the Eastern Native Americans. Eastern Native Americans, or more specifically, the indigenous peoples of the Eastern Woodlands, are composed of tribes hailing from the edges of the Atlantic coast, stretching inland towards the Great Lakes of the North and the Great Plains of the West. These regions included major tribes such as the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Mohican, the Seminole, the Shawnee, and the Sioux, amongst countless others. The foundational food base for these Eastern Woodland tribes was an agricultural system called the Three Sisters. The Three Sisters is composed of three central crops, including maize, which is better known as corn, squash, such as pumpkins or gourds, and common beans, which were cultivated by other civilizations into other beans and legume types, such as the kidney bean. These crop systems were often grown in a style known as companion planting, in which mounds were created by hilling soil surrounding the plant bases every year. These mounds would consist of both the maize and the common beans, with squash planted in between. Another name for common beans are climbing beans, attributed to the nature of their upward growth. With companion planting, the corn stalks acted as a trellis for the beans. And the relationship wasn't one-sided either. In turn for the maize providing a platform for the beans, the nitrogen found in the legume's roots helped keep the corn stalks from being destroyed in high winds and rainstorms. The squash wasn't without its vital role in the companion systems too. Certain variations of the plant would harbor thorn-like prickled hairs, scaring off marmots and deer from eating away all of the crops. Winter squash especially would sprout large, wide-spanning leaves that created plenty of shade at the base of the mounds. With excess shade, the soil could remain moist and fight off nuisances, such as weeds and unwanted plant growth. In northeastern tribes, they would focus on increasing soil temperatures so that water could drain and the maize could flourish even in the springtime. The Atlantic northeastern tribes, spanning present-day New England, would include additives to their soil as natural fertilizers. These additives included rotten saltwater fish and dried eels, and were especially sought after during years in which the soil was below the needed quality. When it came to tilling, certain tribes, such as the Haudenosaunee, refused to stir or overturn their soil. This practice also acted as a natural fertilizer, preventing widespread soil erosion and soil oxidation. In other words, it kept the organic compound matter within the soil healthy and harmonious with the crops. In terms of the physical structure of the companion systems, mounds would be formed into 12-inch high piles, spanning around 20 inches wide. However, this varied with changes in plant selections and specific agricultural decisions. Of course, 
Not all Eastern Woodland tribes use the exact same crops for each of their three sister systems. Rather, specific plants were cultivated across the polycultures of the Americas, dating back thousands of years ago. These crops started with the domestication of squash 9,000 years ago before eventually evolving into the trifecta, with maize and common beans three to 4,000 years later. The fact of the matter was, the Americas didn't feature large seeded grains like the rest of the Old World, spanning the continents of Africa, Asia, and Europe. These crops were readily domesticated and were easily cultivated with the assistance of domesticated animals that could ease the burden of manual labor. As a result, the indigenous populations across both Central and North America were forced to adapt to their land's produce, and companion planting of the Three Sisters was born. Historians estimate these developments were executed first in the region called Mesoamerica, between 4000 and 3000 BC. Records from early European excursions to the Americas confirms many of these reports. 16th century documents were found to describe the Three Sisters crop systems as flourishing along the Atlantic coasts of both the present-day United States and Canada. The documents also suggest squash, maize, and beans were the major trading goods offered by Eastern Woodland tribes when the Europeans first made contact. However, they obviously did not stick as the colonies mixed in more of their transatlantic diet. Despite the records, however, the legitimacy of the Three Sisters as a dependable food supply has been questioned. Some believed these three crops would not be enough to sustain an active, growing human body, much less an entire tribe. It wasn't until the 1970s that further research was underway to analyze these claims. Led by scientists of the Soviet Union, the studies found that bean and legume crops do in fact boost the yield and quality of maize when planted together. The research was eventually published in a peer-reviewed journal by 1972. Even when looking at the Three Sisters crops from a nutritional standpoint, it's hard to imagine these specific plants not providing the perfect sustenance for the Eastern Woodland tribes. When broken down, squash, maize, and beans all feature the nine amino acids essential to sustaining human life. This is possible through maize protein, working with the bean and squash seed protein to enhance their nutritional value. Combine this with the fatty acids, complex carbohydrates, and various vitamins found in the crop's flesh, the people consuming the Three Sisters had everything they needed. They also had bountiful amounts of each crop as well. The lack of tilling led to prominent soil fertility, making it possible for tribes to remain on their farms for years without having to slash and burn, which was the original hypothetical method for Eastern woodland agriculture. The biggest impact the Three Sisters and companion planting had on tribes, and specifically the Haudenosaunee culture, was its foundation for a sedentary life. Many tribes prior to the 16th century were either nomadic or semi-nomadic, with the crop needing little to no transference across farmland or countryside, the need to move in order to find more fertile land was rendered useless. And as the three sisters provided the bulk of the tribe's needed sustenance, chasing wild game or seeking varied foods for changing seasons was also no longer necessary. Each crop could be grown with high yields and preserved for long winters, allowing the Haudenosaunee to set up their posts and remain in one place. With a focus on the Three Sisters agriculture system, many dishes that have stuck around into the modern day were first prepared by Eastern Woodland tribes hundreds of years ago, based on the three crops they mastered over time. One of the most iconic traditional dishes is colloquially referred to as succotash. The name is derived from succotah hash, a word in Algonquian language meaning broken corn kernels. Succotash originally consisted of two main ingredients, which just so happened to be two of the three main components to the three sisters, maize and beans. The most common strain of maize used in tribal succotash was sweet corn and was accompanied by various types of American beans. In the summertime, 
they might come in the form of lima beans, a legume domesticated in Mesoamerica a few thousand years ago before becoming a staple of warm weather farms in the mid-Atlantic region of North America. In other locales along the eastern woodlands, tribes would either trade or sustain their own common beans to prepare succotash year-round. When crafting the dish, both the sweet corn and the shell beans would either be roasted or boiled over fire or hot embers. After the crops were cooked, they would be tossed together with various herbs and spices. The herbs and spices varied from region to region, but common ingredients included sumac, wild onions or garlic, and bay leaves. Various woodland tribes would even add a bit of extra animal fat to add both flavor and additional nutrition to the succotash. Another maize-based dish popular amongst woodland natives, especially the aforementioned Algonquian tribe, was cornbread. The earliest versions of cornbread were loaves made with ground-up corn or hominy, which were corn kernels soaked in lime water before being washed and hulled. The corn flour would then be mixed with milk or water, creating dough. Over an open fire, the dough would then be cooked thoroughly until it produced a hefty and hearty loaf of cornbread. This type of cornbread was then evolved into its modern-day adaptations by Europeans in the 19th century, with the inclusion of buttermilk, baking soda, eggs, and pork products. Cornmeal at large was a widely popular ingredient for many other dishes served along the Atlantic coast. It was combined with cranberries and clams as a side dish amongst present-day New England tribes. Cornmeal was also derived by the Wabanaki nations into infant formula for babies whose mothers could not nurse on their own. These same tribes also utilized local nuts to create their own nut milk for both infants and children. Specifically, hickory nuts were a staple to Cherokee diets. Hickory was an abundant resource for food in the forests and various woodlands occupied by the Cherokee, and the sweetness in its flavor was preferred by many tribal communities. The nuts were normally ground up into nut flour and boiled in water to create a warm, saccharine dish called kanuchi, or kanuche. Other eastern woodland tribes had a sweet tooth as well. Maple syrup was a popular fixture in meals and prepared foods. First, sap was extracted from sugar maple trees right as winter turned to spring. As long as the nights were still cold, they would use the bark from birch trees, and the sap was stored before it could be boiled or turned into maple syrup or maple sugar. To create maple taffy, the tree sap would be boiled until it reached a certain temperature, usually 235 to 245 degrees Fahrenheit. Then it would be removed from the heat as it thickened before being poured into the snow. It was a simple yet delicious dish enjoyed by many woodland tribes. When it came to meat and game, there were various animals hunted by eastern indigenous tribes, all varying in both the methods used and the types of game they ate. In general, a wide variety of selected prey included deer, bison, rabbit, squirrel, and turkey. On rare occasions, bears, elk, and raccoons were killed, as their pelts, bones, and fur were valuable resources for both trade and personal use. Hunting white-tailed deer was especially common. Not only did they provide bountiful sources to meat, but their antlers and bones were vital for both toolmaking and decoration. It wasn't the easiest game to kill, but once the hunters learned patience and studied the animal's habits and behaviors, it became second nature. Like the game, the techniques used when hunting prey were also diversified amongst woodland tribes. Some hunting bands preferred tracking and stalking their prey, utilizing snares hidden in the wilderness. Other bands used a method called drive hunting, in which a group of skilled hunters would systematically push their game in an area filled with either traps or another faction of hunters waiting for the kill. Most eastern woodland folk were also avid fishers, as many tribes lived near rivers and streams or other plentiful water sources, especially in the mountains. Spearing, netting, and trapping were all skills learned and taught by tribal leaders and taught to the community's youth. If one wasn't a hunter or a fisherman, they might be tasked with gathering fruits and other ingestibles. Wild berries were immensely favored, not only for food, but for medicinal and ceremonial purposes as well. 
It isn't until you take a deeper dive into the cuisine of Eastern Woodland Native Americans do you begin to appreciate the dedication they had towards developing enriched dishes from all sorts of natural foods. Like it still is today, cooking was a vital aspect to so many indigenous cultures. Their diet might not be their only descriptor, but it paints such a beautiful portrait of what the frontier and its folk had to offer.